guys went to fellowship time, I re rewrote my sermon so it would be a little bit quicker. If you are new here, welcome first off, but maybe you've noticed that Cornerstone might not necessarily look like all other churches all the time. That's because church isn't about coming to a classroom and hearing a preacher preach a sermon. That's not what the church is. We are the church, we are the body, and we're here for one another. And so as I told Marcy before we started the service, I said, you know, maybe we just need to make up some hot cocoa and sit in a circle and drink hot cocoa and be together and pray. It's not a bad idea, is it? Well, you're not quite that lucky. You're still going to get a sermon. But I am going to, uh, it's, it's going to be broken up into this week and next week. So some people after a morning like this will come to me and say, just keep preaching. And others are going, my roast is burning. <laughs> and so I want to be conscientious of those things and just try to, uh, to meet somewhere that is going to honor God most of all and leave us with something that we can take. So good morning, church family. It's good to see you this morning. Marnie and I were gone last week. We had some airline tickets that still needed to be used up from when we took sabbatical, and so we took the opportunity to fly to Florida, spend some time with some friends that we love dearly, a, a pastor couple that uh, we're friends with. And now before you picture Marnie and I on a beach in the sunshine, thankfully, and I've got witnesses here because some of the Yonkins also went to Florida last week, it was cold there. Okay, we did have a few warmer days, like it almost hit, I think it was about 67 one day. Otherwise, it was pretty chilly. Our, our flight home was delayed because it was 28 degrees and the planes were frozen over and they don't have anything to take the frost off in Florida. So we had to wait. However, there was green grass and that was beautiful. <laughs> Let's just pray. I'll pray rather quickly and we'll, we'll keep going here. So Father, God in heaven, I want to come to you today with just a real need to know your presence. Father, help us to comprehend that we have a voice before the throne of God. And when we sit here and we go through a prayer and praise time, we are before your throne. And what an honor, what a privilege, and how important that is. You, the King of Kings, worthy of all our praise, who came to seek and save the lost, came to bring us comfort, you hear us. Help us to worship you and to serve. In your name, amen. So when I was here last, two weeks ago, we began to talk about what it is to unravel or unwrap this uh, this idea of Jesus being the Messiah. And I pointed out that the three Old Testament um, offices that were held by the Messiah is that he was the prophet, he was the priest, and he's king. And I'm saying was, but it's not just he was, he is. He always will be. Prophet, priest, and king. And as promised, I said we're going to come back to look at some of this a little more closely because as we look at Jesus as the Messiah in John chapter 1, when we go through these verses, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh, took up residence among us, we observed His glory, the glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace, and then we see that this is Jesus. And when we read in John chapter 1, Andrew... Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who heard John, followed him. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought Simon to Jesus. Now, I hope you can connect right there that the fact is, when he, what he's saying is, we found the Messiah, and the Messiah is Jesus, and I'm bringing you to Jesus. What does it mean to be the Messiah? And I don't want to just breeze past these things. Because, guys, this, 
this Jesus that we are talking about, when we say he is our savior, yes, he is our savior. And that is our anchor. But the fact is, he didn't just come and die on the cross. And now it's, yes, the work there on the cross is done. We can be saved before him. But that's only the beginning of our eternal relationship with him. It's only a start. And he is our anchor. He is our foundation. He is our shoreline, as I said a couple of weeks ago. He is our hope. And Sandy talked about hope. We've been talking about hope for a little while here. Um, we are so in need of hope. And you know, I, I said, I, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, we put mom into hospice on Thursday. But you know what? We don't mourn as those who have no hope. Because we know that those who are in Christ have eternity with him. This is only the beginning. And it's good. Sure, we're, I'm going to miss my mom when she passes. Whether that's three weeks, six weeks, six months, I don't know. God knows. Sure, I'm going to miss her. But I don't mourn as those who have no hope. Mark Daigle, and I, boy, I know some of you met him at one time or another. Mark, like 6'5", 300 pounds of sheer muscle, and cancer just took his body and, and destroyed the body. But cancer cannot destroy his eternal soul. And Mark, who we saw just a few weeks ago in the hospital over in Sioux Falls, and, uh, you know, Things are going downhill quickly for his body, but he says, well, when the Lord is ready for me, I guess he's ready. And, and Mark's in his early 60s, so he's not that old. Mark had such a solid faith and foundation, a hope that would carry him through. So when Marnie and I were in Florida, we, uh, we took a little side trip one day, which is kind of a dream for me and probably... One of those dream for me and for Marnie, like, okay, I'll go. Try. You know, I, I, she she was okay with some of it, but we went to Cape, Can, or, yeah, to Cape Canaveral. We went to Kennedy Space Center, and I got to walk in. No, okay, first off, guys, it's like 40 degrees and the wind is blowing 150 miles an hour, something like that. I'm sure it was cold, and you walk between buildings, but we go in. And I look up to see the Saturn V rocket up there. Now, Saturn V was the rocket ship that took all of the Apollo missions. So when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, it was a Saturn V that brought it up there and sent it on its way. This rocket is 36 stories tall. That is three of Nokomis's on top of each other. The weight, get this, the weight of that ship is 6.2 million pounds when it's on the ground ready to take off the fuel. Think about how much force there has to be to lift 6.2 million pounds off the ground and hurl it into space. Can't, I can't even fathom that. Incredible. The cost is unbelievable what it was. But I, I, I was thinking about some of this while I was there. One of the missions that you're all probably fairly familiar with is the Apollo 13 mission. The Apollo 13 mission was going to go and land on the moon. They ended up having issues once they got up around the moon. And they just had to try and make their way back. This entire scenario, as I look at these things there, and by the way, saw the Apollo 11 capsule as it, after, you know, that splash down in the ocean. It's kind of like seeing the Grand Canyon, though. You're looking at it thinking, I can't believe I'm actually looking at what I'm looking at, right? When Apollo 13 was trying to make its way back, if everybody would have given up hope, that story would have ended up very differently. But there were a few 
who had hope. And there were people praying, of course. The country was coming together, praying for these astronauts, trying to get them back. When I think about the size of this thing and what it takes to just launch the thing, it is beyond my ability to even comprehend that this is possible. And then to think about what they had to do to get them back seems Seriously, seems like it is a 99.99% chance that they're going to die. But there were those who had hope and said, okay, one step at a time, and we're going to move forward, and we're going to hope. We're going to pray. And they came back, and, you know, and then you see these astronauts on the video screen at Kennedy Space Center talking to you, Jim Lovell, and you're thinking, he, this was him. This was the guy that went through this. We need hope. Jesus Christ is our hope, our anchor. And we might not be able to figure out exactly how all this works, but there is a beautiful intertwining between the Old Testament and the New Testament, which can give us a hope and a foundation that tells us that this possibility of getting them back when you think, okay, well, there were guys there that knew, okay, we need these numbers. We need to calculate these things and do algebra that nobody wanted to pay attention to in high school. But these guys did for some reason, and they were able to get them back. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't understand everything that God can do and will do, but he does it. And he has promised us that we will have eternity with Christ in heaven. And those promises aren't based on nothing. They are based on truth. And when, when I look at the fact that he is the prophet, the priest, the king, as we go into this series of looking at the fact that in the Old Testament, there were 60 major prophecies telling about the Messiah who is going to be coming. The uh, Jewish rabbis of the day recognized that we're upwards of 456 verses alluding to the Messiah that was to come. So when I read this, I read that uh, he says, we have found the Messiah. You need to read something into that. They were looking for him, weren't they? He was expected to come. Why? Because for centuries... There were promises from God. He's coming. And we're going to be looking at some of those promises. But as we begin to go into this and look at the fact that these prophecies told of the Messiah, they told about what he was going to be like. And one of those things was he would be a coming king who would rule. That the, the world would be his footstool. And I get a little bit excited, actually, when I study the prophecies and fulfillment of these prophecies when it comes to the Messiahship. And you look at, that is not the right verse there. There it is, Luke 24, 44 to 49. Then he told them, that's Jesus. Jesus says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law, everything written about me, everything written about the Messiah in the law of Moses, all of the prophets, the Psalms, those prophecies need to be fulfilled. He says, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning at, in, at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my father promised. God the Father promised this is what was going to be coming. And there were those that had hope and looked on. Now, put yourself in the position of some of these prophets, like Isaiah, 700 years before, who's prophesying of the coming king. Guys, 
if God gave me a promise and six months later it hasn't come about yet, I'm starting to get impatient. Two years down the line, I'm thinking, oh, I must have just eaten some bad chili or something. And I don't know what's going on. 700 years later, they're still watching. They're still looking. They still have hope. The promises are still there. And God fulfilled each one of those promises. What an amazing thing. And it, it, the prophecies from the Old Testament are not prophecies, prophecies of like, well, there's going to be a, 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 a Jewish guy from Chicago that's going to, uh, that's going to come out of Chicago and he's going to, to be on the news and, and lead everybody away. I mean, like, non, like non, that's not a prophecy. That's like, I mean, how many people do that? There's a lot of people that come out of Chicago. We're going to send a Messiah. He's going to be born in a really little town called Bethlehem. He's going to be born of a virgin. <laughs> oh, there's only one of those. He's going to end up living in Nazareth. He'll be a Nazarene, right? This is how he's going to die. Not a bone is going to be broken. He's going to be pierced. He's going to die a crucifixion. The, the, the details that start to, can be unpacked from the Old Testament of saying, here's who he's going to be, are so much more accurate than even saying, Steve Stahl, 406 3rd Avenue, Southeast, Pipestone, Minnesota. He tells so much more than just giving an address. And we see who it is. And the promise is true. And we have a promise. And that is our anchor. And boy, do I have a lot more sermon left even after I've cut it. But I'm going to ask worship team to come back up. That should at least get you a little excited about what we're going to be going into. Guys, I just want to say where we're going to be heading into, we're going to talk about these things of what this means. Son of God, son of man, son of Abraham, son of David, Shiloh, Lion of Judah, Lamb of God. So that'll be coming up next week. And it just gets me a little excited about who this Christ is for us as our King. Father, I pray that you would bless our worship this morning. God, as we give of our tithes and offerings on the back table, Lord, I pray that we would just honor you with uh, what you've given us. Help us to be faithful in those ways. Lord, continue to help Cornerstone be the church that you want us to be. Help us to know how to love each other well and to bring you glory and to seek you always in your name. Amen. And stand and join us for the last song. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. space between where I used to be and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how Raise a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. This reckoning. Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I Holds 
between us Nothing stands between us There is no other name but the name that is Jesus He who was and still is and will be through it all So come what may in the space between All the things unseen and this reckoning joy come every battle because I know that's where you'll be Father I thank you that as Steve said we do not mourn as those who have no hope we don't live as those who have no hope so Lord we thank you that um, Jesus Christ crucified risen from the dead and ascended to heaven standing next to God interceding for us that is our hope And Lord, we claim that over this week. We claim that over every minute of every day of every year of our lives. Help us to give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you have a blessed week.